Olá pessoal, olá pessoal, boa tarde, boa tarde. Vocês estão no evento correto, estão no evento correto. Vocês perceberam que teve uma mudança? Teve uma mudança aqui do moderador, daqui da, da pessoa que vai estar com vocês durante a tarde, antes era o Anderson. Vocês podem estar percebendo, mas será que aconteceu? Agora era o Anderson, agora é o Francisco, isso mesmo. Durante todo esse evento, nós vamos ter quatro pessoas que vão estar com vocês em cada turno. Então, hoje, nessa tarde, estarei eu com vocês, tá bom? É... Primeiramente, boa tarde novamente. Eu espero que todo mundo tenha é, bem, bem alimentado, tenha almoçado é, adequadamente, que a, a tarde vai ser sensacional, pessoal. Nossa tarde aí vai ter muitos palestrantes, speakers maravilhosos. Então, com certeza, até o iníciozinho da noite lá, vocês vão ter muito conteúdo de qualidade. Muito conteúdo de qualidade, em outro patamar. Agora, a tarde nossa promete bastante, tá? E para esquentar, para a gente começar a, a, a né, bater os tambores, quando o pessoal está entrando, a gente está vendo aí que o pessoal está entrando, está fazendo um aguardando que o pessoal entre no nosso evento, a gente vai fazer uma enquete. A gente quer fazer uma enquete com vocês, tá bom? Uma enquete bem legal, vocês podem eu pedir para o pessoal da organização do da WG ter um, um grande telão aqui. Infelizmente, eles não puderam, é, o orçamento não deu. Então, de falou, é, fazer o recurso que a gente tinha, né? de forma tradicional. Então, vocês vão entrar nesse, nesse endereço que dá. Acho que eu vou, eu vou, eu, a gente vai colocar no chat assim, aí, mas é do Mente, tá? Acesse lá o Mente, nesse meu, nesse meu painel aqui de última geração. Vocês vão acessar o Mente e vai colocar lá o código 95 33 888, tá? 95 33 888. Lá vai ter algumas perguntas, né, para a gente entender o perfil né, do nosso público. Então, é muito importante para a gente é que vocês comecem a partilhar as informações com você, conosco, tá? E, com esse intuito de compartilhar, a gente tem que agradecer, primeiramente, aos nossos parceiros. Nós tivemos alguns parceiros, alguns fornecedores aí que, faz, que fazem a diferença. São eles que estão conosco, eles que fazem esse, esse, esse evento acontecer. Então, é o NIC, NICBR, CGI, a CAPES e a nossa Escola Superior de Rede. Então, esses parceiros com certeza precisam ser é, falados constantemente. Acessem o site, acessem as redes sociais dele. Tá? Novamente, CAPS, CGI, NICBR e Escola Superior de Redes. Todos possuem redes sociais, entrem, consomem o conteúdo de todos, que vai ser de grande valia para todos nós, tá bom? Então, falando em redes sociais, a gente tem a nossa rede social. A rede social da RNP é sensacional, pessoal. Não sei se vocês já acessaram as redes sociais da RNP, por exemplo, no YouTube. No YouTube, a gente tem muitos e muitos vídeos do fórum. Tem vários vídeos do fórum lá dentro do, da rede, rede RNP. Então, acesse. Você que não teve a oportunidade, por exemplo, de participar do fórum, participar de alguma palestra, acesse lá o nosso, o nosso YouTube. Você vai ver que grandes palestras, né, grandes trocas de conhecimento vocês vão conhecer lá. Temos o nosso Instagram, temos o nosso Twitter. Então, todas as nossas redes sociais estão aí bombando e nós queremos que vocês façam parte. Para isso... Para isso, a gente tem grandes surpresas. Primeiro, né, você pode ganhar presente. Um presente é um gift de R$ 70, R$ 70,00. Vai, você vai resolver dois problemas. Primeiro problema, o tipo, antes falou isso, né? Sabe aquela amigo público que você está participando agora? Você não comprou ainda? Vai, você pode concorrer esse presente, você já pode aliviar do seu bolso esse amigo oculto. R$ 70,00. E, para isso, você vai nos ajudar e vai te ajudar, seguindo... A, 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 a RNP nas suas redes sociais. Então, pra, novamente, para concorrer a esse gift, você precisa seguir a RNP, tá bom? Lá no, 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 são duas, duas regras. Seguir a RNP nas nossas redes sociais e também depois, é, no final do evento, que vai ser amanhã, você vai nos ajudar de outra forma. Como? Respondendo a nossa pesquisa de satisfação. Todo mundo sabe que essa pesquisa de satisfação nos ajuda a elevar o nível nosso, do, dos nossos eventos. Os eventos online começou este ano, né, praticamente. Então, a gente precisa muito do retorno de vocês. Porque esse retorno vai, 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 vai nos ajudar a evoluir. Né? Vai cada vez mais melhorando, você mostrando o que, que a gente pode fazer, o que, que foi bom para você, o que, que foi ruim, o que, que foi legal. Então, é muito importante a gente ter retorno de vocês. Tá? Então, para isso, você, para você ganhar esse presente, você vai, primeiro, siga a rede... Nacional de Ensino Pesquisa, a RNP, em qualquer uma das nossas plataformas, tá bom? Recomendo muito o Twitter e o YouTube. Você vai ter muito, muito vídeo de qualidade, tá bom? Então, é... outra coisa importante, 
é, a pesquisa de satisfação. Isso é muito importante para a gente. Então, se você fizer esses dois, esses dois, essas duas tarefinhas simples, você vai concorrer esse presente maravilhoso de 70 reais, né, da livraria do público, você vai poder ou se auto-presentear, presentear um amigo oculto ou um familiar. Tá legal? Outra coisa importante da Escola Superior de Rede. Tem que acessar o site da Escola Superior de Rede. Vocês vão ver o portfólio de curso da Escola Superior de Rede é sensacional. Tem cursos de todo tipo. Tá? Desde redes, a, a governança de TI. Então, a gente tem um portfólio gigantesco de curso. E, e você pode ganhar um curso. Você pode ganhar um curso lá na, na nossa Escola Superior de Rede. E, cara, é só esses cursos sensacionais que a Escola Superior de Rede fornece. Né? Para isso, o que você vai ter que fazer? Você também vai ter que seguir a Escola Superior de Rede. Tá bom? Então, você vai ter que ir lá, além das nossas da, da, da redes sociais da, da RB, você vai lá na Escola Superior de Rede, siga a Escola Superior de Rede também. Tá? E, automaticamente, você vai estar concorrendo ao final a um desses cursos maravilhosos. Você vai poder escolher, provavelmente. Eu nem sei se vai poder escolher, mas eu estou chutando aqui. Vai poder escolher. Você vai poder escolher um dos cursos da nossa grade lá da, da Escola Superior de Rede, tá bom? É... E outra coisa, eu estava acompanhando aqui, está tendo muito pouca compartilhamento do hashtag arroba é, WRP2020, tá? Pouquíssimo. Então, a gente precisa de vocês. Dá agora aquele print, tá? Na, na, na sua tela agora, dá aquele print e Twitter, Instagram, enfim, usa a sua plataforma para publicar lá, hashtag arroba RP2020, tá bom? Isso é muito importante para a gente, muito importante para a nossa comunidade, nossa comunidade acadêmica, nossa é, comunidade educacional, porque essa, esse, esse network é importante ser transmitido. Então, a partir do momento que você transmite essa hashtag, outras pessoas vão ter é, é, o conhecimento que esse evento está ocorrendo e, quem sabe, poder também aderir esse, esse, essa nossa rede, pegar as informações que você quiser, ganhar essas informações que nós estamos ganhando aqui hoje com esses palestrantes. Eu acho que eu falei que está errado, eu falei, não, falta mais um pouquinho, eu tenho um minuto ainda, está acabando o tempo. É, a gente também tem a, os, as nossas salões de eventos, né, salões de exposições que é o Inova, tá? que depois, no próximo break, eu vou explicar como você pode acessar esse, essa, esse, esse nosso salão, onde tem os pôsteres né, da, dos nossos, das nossas pesquisas. Mas antes disso, então, eu vou ter o prazer agora tá, de chamar o nosso, o nosso gerente de, de PD, tá? o Marcos. O Marcos, ele vai... Deixa eu ver aqui agora, abrir aqui o nosso, meu, a minha colinha. Né? Aqui, ó. É, o Marcos, ele vai, vai moderar a nossa primeira sessão de Keynote, tá? Keynote Speaker, com, seu, com o Mr. Bout, tá? Onde, onde nós vamos falar, onde vai ter uma palestra muito legal sobre é, os desafios no compartilhamento de plataformas de infraestrutura de apoio à pesquisa de educação em redes de computação e sistemas distribuídos, tá bom? Então, vocês vão estar muito bem acompanhados com o Marcos e o Mr. Bout. Você, Marcos... Marcos? Oi, Francisco. Muito obrigado. É, então, pessoal, teremos agora o nosso primeiro keynote, como o Francisco comentou. Então, é um prazer a gente receber o Ilya Baldi, né? Ele é diretor do projeto é, de, do Testbed Fabric, né? E a gente vai, então, agora ter uma sessão em inglês, onde a gente vai ter um vídeo de 30 minutos falando sobre o projeto é, Fabric, também sobre os desafios, e em seguida a gente vai fazer junto com ele ao vivo uma sessão de perguntas e respostas. So, it's a pleasure to have uh, Ilya Baldin here, a project director for the Fabric Testbed. Uh, Ilya Baldin leads the Rainsy Network Research Infrastructure Group. He's a networking researcher with a wide range of interests, including high-speed optical network architectures, cloud ray uh, interactions, novel signaling schemes, and network security. He was a co-PI for Exo Genie project, which was part of the Genie uh, testbed, and now he's PI and project director of the Fabric testbed. He holds a PhD and master's degree in computer science for North Carolina State University. Uh, we'll have a 30 minutes uh, presentation regarding the Fabric testbed and the challenges in uh, sharing uh, platform infrastructure for support research education in computer networks and distributed systems. And afterwards, we will have a live Q&A section. Uh, can you please uh, play the video, Ryan?
Hello, uh, my name is Ilya Balden. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, give this presentation today. I will be talking about uh, our project called Fabric, uh, adapted for ground bubble research infrastructure for computer science and science applications. Um, first, a little bit about a little bit of background about the project. Um, Fabric was funded by the uh, U.S. National Science Foundation through what's called a mid-scale research infrastructure program in 2019 with a budget of $20 million. Uh, the expected completion uh, four years later would be uh, September of uh, year 2023. The project core team consists of University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill, University of Kentucky, Clemson University, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and U.S. Department of Energy's ESnet, and there are overall uh, 20 overall participating organizations in this project. So first, um, let's take a little bit of a step back and talk about the brief history of you know, test beds in the United States and kind of where we fit in this and, and what some of the challenges are. Um, many people think of fabric as in some way an intellectual successor to Gini, which is uh, at least in part true. So that's kind of, we're gonna use that as a starting point. Um, here I have kind of my own version of what uh, the history of academic test beds, computer science test beds in the United States might look like. Um, you might disagree with it. This is meant merely as, a, as an example. So I would say generation one test beds uh, were created somewhere before 2010. They had basic compute networking capabilities, limited programmability, and or scope. And, uh, those include, for instance, uh, things like uh, tests with like Emulab, uh, Planet Lab. They had very important uses. They've spawned a number of other very important test beds, but they were the first uh, generation test beds, I would call. Then uh, somewhere in 2010, 2015, there were generation two test beds where we had widely distributed uh, resources, advanced programmability, some cloud computing, early five, fifth generation wireless experiments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, 2015 through now, you know, kind of this is where we have generation three test beds, merging of 5G, IoT, optical networks, cloud computing, early machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. Etc. And the generation four test beds now would be widely heterogeneous resources, advanced uses of machine learning AI capabilities, large dedicated bandwidths, wide range of programmability, configurability, data as a service. This is kind of where the fabric fits into this fourth generation. Uh, some takeaways based on the history, if you look at the successful uh, test beds like Planet Lab, like MDLAB. Uh, why do they get built and why do they stay around? Well, they get built because there's a favorable combination of community needs and there is a capability gap in existing test beds that they address. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the creation of test beds or refresh of test beds is caused by um, our new hardware capabilities that come about and, of course, available funding. Some prerequisites for a successful test bed project is there needs to be a community of builders, people who know how to build infrastructure like that. And there needs to be one or more communities of users ready to use the infrastructure when it's, when it's done, when it's completed. So in, in other words, timing is, is everything. Uh, test bed life cycle can be complicated. Uh, they um, sometimes start small and build on that experience, transform over the years, maybe even rebrand themselves. Uh, but they're sustained by user communities, they're sustained by user need. Some, and some test beds sunset over time, and that's totally okay. Um, but the important takeaway uh, for us, uh, for, as builders of fabric, is that building a successful test bed, it's all about making trade-offs. And I will talk about that in just a second. So the meta challenge in, in, in constructing a test bed is really about staying relevant to the needs of the different experimental communities. And as I said, a lot of it boils down to making the right trade-offs. And what are some of those trade-offs? Well, uh, a, a kind of a very visible one is usability versus flexibility. If, as a test bed, you offer a lot of very um, kind of easy to use, but kind of complicated under the covers mechanisms to provision resources, for instance, um, that makes the test bed easier to use, but it, take, it may take away some of the flexibilities by essentially removing 
some of the lower level abstractions from user view and thus making it less interesting to that particular community. Functionality versus stability, if you make your test bed very complex, it may affect its stability, again, users may suffer. And resource diversity versus availability is another typical one. Do you buy a lot of kind of a small number of resources versus uh, is spread your resources, you know, make your resources very diverse, but any single pool of resources of a given type may be quite small. And that, again, going one way or the other can turn away, away certain communities. Uh, some communities prefer a very, very broad set of uh, resources, like, you know, 15 types of GPUs, and others just want a lot of compute power. And if you have 15 types of GPUs, but, but few of them of any given type, you may not be able to support experiments of a given community that just wants a lot of a single type of GPU. And there's more, but these are kind of the most visible ones. So um, in my talk, I will talk a little bit about how we are addressing these challenges, but now I'm going to talk about kind of what Fabric is and why it is uh, and how it's coming about. So. Uh, a little bit about Fabric Leadership Team. Uh, there's myself, Anita Nikolic, Deputy Director of the Facility in Dermanga. He's Executive Director of ESNet. Jim Gafuin uh, from the University of Kentucky. Casey Wang from Clemson. Tom Lehman, Paul Ruth, Zalmin Bay. And as I mentioned, that the, that's the leadership team represents the core institutions. We actually have more than 20 institutions on the team uh, working on this project. So why did Fabric come about? Well, um, in our opinion, and, and actually, this was spurred by some discussions that, that occurred at a, a workshop uh, hosted by National Science Foundation. Um, there's been a, a great leap and, and change in economics of compute and storage that is not really accounted for in, in the architecture of the internet the way that we are constructing, no how to construct it today. Basically, it boils down to if we have to build a router from scratch today with the economics of compute and storage as we know it today, it probably wouldn't look like the routers we built today. In other words, there's a lot of legacy assumptions built into everything. Um, to boot, there's an explosion of capabilities on augmented types of computing, GPUs, FPGAs, other types of kind of uh, ancillary computing capabilities. So all of that really boils down to an opportunity that we can try to reimagine a network architecture as being more stateful simply because technologically now we can maintain and process more state something that wasn't possible before. Uh, layer on top of that machine learning AI revolution, we can now start thinking about a, of a network as a big data instrument, not something that carries big data, but produces big data itself. And we can use it for studying network behaviors, we can use it for real-time measurements and, and control loops, so on and so forth. And in fact, there's a kind of a marketing term that uh, comes out from Jupiter, Jupiter, Juniper, excuse me, the CTO, Kiriti Pambella, calling it self-driving network. Of course, provisioning, cybersecurity, other applications can all benefit from machine learning and AI. At the edge, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with IoT and 5G. And, you know, while Fabric focuses on the terrestrial portion of the network, we can't forget that the edge is going to be wireless and it's going to have billions and billions upon devices, of billions upon billions of devices operating there. How do you merge that wireless edge? To, the, to this terrestrial wired high-speed core is a very interesting architectural question. It's interesting from network architecture, protocol, application uh, perspective, all of those. Of course, given that we are uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, one of our main focal points is, of course, supporting new science applications, new distributed science applications that um, uh, improve time to discovery, make scientists' lives easier in enabling them to collect and process and store data that they collect from the instruments. And what that really boils down to is now Fabric, with its, with its capability to provide state compute and storage within the network itself, really allows for a continuum of computing capabilities. Now, you shouldn't, you, you, you don't have to think um, uh, of, network, of, of computing architecture in, in terms of fixed points. So I'm going to compute at the edge or I'm going to compute in the cloud. Now you compute, you can compute and process data everywhere. Network becomes part of the computing substrate. So what is Fabric? Fabric is a nationwide programmable network testbed with significant compute storage cap uh, capabilities at each node, essentially where normally you find a router 
in fabric, you find a cluster that includes a capable switch and router, but also servers that can be interposed onto the paths of packet flows, and they can process that data in real time in very high volumes. We provide GPUs, a collection of GPUs, FPGAs, and network processes with each node. Support quality service on our dedicated optical links with 100 gigabits per second and faster. We importantly interconnect national facilities like HPC centers, cloud wireless test beds. We allow peering with the internet um, uh, such that fabric is meant not to be a sandbox where each uh, uh, experiment must be sort of self-contained, but rather it opens up opportunities for experiments to bring in external resources, external instruments, external computational capabilities to um, include in their uh, experiments. Here we see a fabric topology as it is planned. Uh, we're starting to deploy today. I will, I will, um, I will address the status of the project. Uh, dark blue nodes are co-located with ESNet6 locations. So this is the Energy Sciences Network, Next Generation Network. Uh, blue lines are 100 uh, per second links, and yellow is what we call our terabit core or tera core, where we anticipate speeds of uh, a terabit or 1.2 terabits per second. We have peering points with public clouds uh, through internet, through our partnership with internet too, and also uh, as well as peering with production internet. Um, so fabric is uh, meant to serve a number of communities, as I mentioned. You know, test bits live and die by uh, being relevant uh, uh, by staying relevant to the communities that they serve. So Fabric is intended to enable new internet and science applications, advances in cybersecurity, performance computing, wireless and IoT, including those in the experiments, integration of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and of course, Fabric is also a platform on which the next generation of researchers will grow. Some key features from Fabric. Uh, first of all, you know, Fabric is, allows one to think of network as part of the computing continuum. It is what we call everywhere programmable using a number of abstractions like P4, OpenFlow using built-in devices. We have diverse compute storage capabilities, as I mentioned, dedicated capacity, network capacity, uh, ability to peer with the internet. You also can think of Fabric as a scientific instrument, and therefore it has pervasive measurement uh, collection capabilities that live both in and outside the slice of the experiment topologies. Uh, and, and one of the interesting and important factors is that every site has a GPS discipline PPP clock. So now you can think of experiments that take very precise snapshots of traffic going through the network at synchronized points in time with accuracy of a few milliseconds, a few tens of milliseconds. <clears throat> An extension to Fabric is a project called FAB, which was independently recently funded by the uh, National Science Foundation. FAB stands for Fabric Across Borders. It's our global expansion. We're using FAB for funding. We will be adding nodes in Japan, uh, United Kingdom, uh, EU, and at CERN. And it also brings with it some new use cases, which I will touch on a little bit later in the presentation. So what does a fabric node look like? Well, we, first of all, we, we, call, we give it a brief uh, kind of a name, call, call it a hank, even the fabric. A hank is actually a bunch of yarn, letter, which you can make out of. So uh, we also refer to it as a disaggregated router because essentially you can, it, it, it is what a router consists of, but broken up into multiple pieces that can be independently uh, provisioned. So you have a head node that contains some rotating storage, you have worker nodes on which you can provision individual virtual machines or containers to which you can attach PCI devices of different types, GPUs, FPGAs, network cards, SSDs. Uh, there's, as I mentioned, there's a capable uh, router switch uh, that faces the external degrees of that site and that portion is programmable so you can create topologies and connect those elements into those topologies the way that you wish. And I will talk about that in just a minute and how it can all be used. A um, little bit of details, these are Dell servers, 64 core total, uh, for, for this is a first generation design, there are GPUs, NVIDIA and RTX 6000s, storage of about 250 terabytes per site, network ports at 2500 gigabits per second, FPGAs, Mellanox Connect X5 and 6 cards, and of course all the access is provided with kernel bypass so that you have and full control of that hardware when you are provisioning the, the uh, resources. 
For measurement hardware, as I mentioned, there's GPS discipline clock at every site um, that supports PTP. Uh, NICs are capable of very accurate packet uh, sampling timestamping using that PTP. Uh, programmable port mirroring, smart PDUs that allow you to measure power consumption, optical layer measurements were available, and of course the traditional CPU memory disk port uh, utilization, port errors, all of that uh, collected for you uh, um, using a building blocks that we provide. So where we are with the project is we're at the beginning of year two. Our plan is by middle to sort of the latter, later half of this year, you get to early experiments. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the project overall is four years long. We've just, uh, we, we're almost, com we've almost completed the deployment of the three development sites and our first production site for Starlight facility is now being assembled by our integrator. We're working on a number of software packages to support the experimentation. As I mentioned, we're expecting our experiments in the summer of 2021. So uh, next, I want to talk about some of the building blocks uh, that a fabric experimenter can expect. Uh, a little bit of terminology. Each experiment is a topology, a slice. Slices consist of slivers. An individual sliver is a individually programmable or configurable resource. So it could be a virtual machine, could be a link, uh, could be uh, something else. Slices can change over time. They can add or drop slivers to grow or shrink. Um, so they're elastic. And slice topologies can be built using a custom layer two uh, services, network services, or rely on a persistent layer three. Uh, so if your experiment doesn't require removing IP, uh, and maybe you're working on just a higher up the stack with distributed applications, we have that available as well. So basic slower classes would be nodes, links, and measurement points. <clears throat> So what are some of the uh, typical slivers that you might expect to be able to build out of fabric? Well, first, let's talk to, take a very simple one, a bump and wire. Let's say that you have a path with a fabric and you want to sample packets in the middle of that path. So you would put that in the middle of the path uh, in your topology. Here's your in, your out, your egress, your ingress. You might have some SSDs, which help you um, uh, collect the data in real time, maybe even process on it using the GPU. You have your virtual CPUs and the smart make that's programmable allows you to um, perhaps collect the packets, drop packets if you need to, or just pass them through as a bump and lie would suggest. And of course you're doing it all with precise timing from the uh, PTP source of this GPS discipline. Um, a kind of building on that example, you can build a small port count uh, router using a couple of network cards working together using PCI bus directly because you have access to it. Um, you might be able to use a OVS built into those switches and, you know, the small port count could be four physical ports or some number of virtual connections that you distinguish, for instance, by VLAN headers or something like that. And you can do that using the ConnectX 5, 6 cards that are, um, come with every site. Um, you might be able to build an FPGA or a P4 router sliver where, you know, you replace the um, network cards with FPGAs and now you have a much fuller control. You might be able to uh, build your own framing on top of the Ethernet frames that we provide the transport. Um, again, they're connected by PCI, and you can uh, you can have n uh, virtual ports on such a uh, on such a construct. And we will provide a pipeline to deploy P4 code on FPGAs. Um, of course, storage could be important to your application. So these are the typical, uh, uh, very familiar, I would say, tiers of storage. You have RAM attached in VME drives. It's the next fastest local rotating storage in the worker node that you can see in your virtual machine. And of course, external, slower, but larger rotating storage that's available in that same site, but not on the node. And you can get slivers of, of storage depending on kind of your needs to, uh, to support your experiment. Another example is in-network uh, artificial intelligence machine learning. You might use the GPUs, the RTX 6000s, which are good for both learning and inference. Uh, again, you might rely on very fast drives to stream data in and out. You can do intelligent data fusion. You can do in-network analytics. You can do uh, federated machine learning. Kind of any number of experiments are possible. As I mentioned, Fabric is not meant to be a sandbox testbed, so every experiment can also have external facilities attached to it using either a layer two or layer three peering offered by the testbed. So here I'm showing a supercomputer on campus or one of the facilities we're connecting, like Texas Supercomputing Center, TAC, or 
at CSA or Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center or, or San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, or maybe one of the test beds like Cloud Lab or Chameleon Cloud or one of the 5G test beds. They'll fall kind of into that category where you can join your topology with that external resource. And very similarly, through our partnership with Internet 2, you connect or you can connect public clouds to your experiment uh, using their Cloud Connect system. So you're working with Google or AWS or Azure. So if you say you have a VPC in AWS, you should be able to connect it to uh, your experiment within Fabric. And of course, also possible uh, using VPN to even bring your own sort of personal device, laptop or your desktop into an experiment uh, using VPN. Of course, quality of service in that case isn't guaranteed, but uh, reachability is still possible. So for some experiments, that is, that is important. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of testbed services. And this is not a new idea, but we kind of follow that idea quite religiously. Um, each testbed, uh, whether you know, we realize it or not, but they, you know, they offer a certain set of testbed services, which are relatively small number of abstractions. They're reliable and well understood. Right? And if, if those three things hold, then that makes for a successful testbed. And on top of that, and, and it becomes like an assembly language for your experiment. So sometimes it may be hard to use because it's too low level. So that's where experiment profiles come to help. And they are essentially like subroutines. Uh, if we were to follow the analogy of programming language, so that uh, out of those uh, building blocks, you can build, slightly, build slight, slightly larger building blocks, which you can then uh, build into larger, grow into larger experiments. So experiment profiles are typically built by experimenters. They could be provided by the testbed operators kind of to seed the initial set, but they're meant to be shareable. And as I said, they're meant to be somewhat more complex than the testbed services. And, the important concept when building a testbed is holding this line, this red line, that separates testbed services from experiments as low as possible because that's what allows for greatest flexibility to the experimenters. As you start pushing this line up and you start obscuring these abstractions, you may make your testbed more usable by some communities, but at the same time, you make, let, you make it less interesting to others because certain, some of those abstractions have become unavailable and they were of interest to that community. So we try to hold that line quite low, as close to hardware as possible. Um, keeping that in mind, fabric network services are kind of an example of what we're trying to, kind of how we follow in this philosophy. Uh, first of all, just a little bit of nomenclature. Fabric is not a network. It is a test bed that provides network services. And that's very important to understand. So, um, you know, if you're a researcher who just wants to move bits very fast from point A to point B, Fabric isn't necessarily for you because Fabric is meant to enable experiments on traffic that traverses it, not just to carry bits. Uh, and we provide a variety of options to connect the compute slippers into topologies. And, you know, the genie-like approach is the layer two, you know, kind of uh, Ethernet, uh, but it looks like Ethernet, uh, uh, um, like VLANs. Um, and uh, they're built on top of our uh, MBLS segment uh, routed uh, technologies uh, and support quality of service, um, support connectivity from between ports, between sites. They don't necessarily assume the use of IP protocols. So this is where experiments with um, protocol stacks like the name data networking or others that don't assume the need for IP can take place. And the routing in that case must be built into the experiment by experiment profile. So you, we might provide an instance of a, of a BGP, like OBGP or something like that, to help uh, uh, um, an experimenter build IP connectivity within such a construct. Um, and each you know, each layer of topology is dedicated to an individual experiment, provides excellent isolation in terms of uh, quality of service. Um, the other alternative is layer three routed service. So we Fabric will offer a layer three routed service to any sliver that wants to connect to it. It's going to be high performance, IPv6 based. Uh, and it will provide period with production networks so, such that if you attach your sliver to that service, you also have uh, ability to access the broader internet if, if that's what you want to do under some controls, of course, to avoid um, uh, security incidents in terms of experiments uh, going uh, out of control. So as I mentioned, peering a number of times, peering is possible both at layer two and layer three. Um, it could be appearing uh, with a uh, publicly routable layer three topology 
is done using fabric managed BGP instances of, of well, on the other hand, peering of layer two topology has to be done together by the experimenter and, and fabric because the experimenter must deploy BGP instances of her topology. There will be multiple peering points provided by ESNet and Internet2 to, to support that functionality. I mentioned that Fabric is an instrument, it's a scientific instrument, and that's a very important concept. So Fabric provides the ability to collect data both from inside the slice, so this is the figure of a slice that's kind of superimposed on top of the map of the United States, and this is the map of Fabric also superimposed on the map of the United States. So if you're an experimenter, you can collect data from inside your slice, <clears throat> and we'll provide some building blocks to do that. You might also be able, you might also need to collect data from outside your slice. For instance, you might want to collect power consumption uh, from the nodes that on which your virtual instances are running. And that's something that isn't really part of your slide, but it's related to your slice. And again, you'll be able to do that. <clears throat> Finally, there are ways to just collect infrastructure health in general from over, over fabric, regardless of which slice um, is, is independent of the slice is running on. And so we will provide ways to collect all that data. We're building these building blocks right now and deploying them. Um, such that an experimenter can have kind of a rich um, vocabulary of different types of measurements which they can bring to bear to solve the particular problem they're trying to address. So now we get to a few last slides and um, we're going to talk about uh, the use cases. So uh, we originally proposed Fabric with a relatively small number of use cases that were meant to be a sample of a very broad space of possible experiments that can take place on Fabric. And we intended for them to be design drivers, and that's a very specific purpose, uh, which basically serves to help us refine our design, validate our design. And so they were picked as, as kind of independent, unbiased samples of that space, such that we could, you know, if we could serve all of these samples, we could make some claims to the fact that the fabric should serve in a large number of other experiments that aren't included in that sample. And they come from a number of institutions who are part of the team. Stanford Research Institute, Georgia Tech, University of Virginia, Florida International University, and you can kind of see some of the topics here. Uh, with FAB, we also brought in a number of domain-oriented use cases. So for instance, efficient distribution and in-network fusion of astronomical event data, which was an interest to uh, LSST Vera Rubin uh, teams as well, as well as a CNBS4 astronomical experiment. Uh, urban sensing, connecting the 5G Cosmos testbed in the United States and the University of Bristol 5G testbed. They're both very interested in this, in this topic of urban sensing and uh, understanding the urban environments in different countries, what's, what, what commonalities, what distinctions there are between them. Uh, weather science, of course, uh, weather and climate are always uh, high on everybody's mind today. So efficiently distributing data on weather events is another way in which fabric, a testbed that's built to support in-network processing and in-network state can have a lot of value. And of course, what I would call more, more um, computer science oriented use cases like censorship evasion, uh, private 5G networks that span multiple countries, SDX policy negotiations numbers. And we have other institutions that are working on these experiments with us or developing these experiments with us. A uh, slightly kind of broader view, um, you know, high energy physics, they have always been a driver of novel architectures, novel distributed applications because of the uh, enormous needs for moving data and processing data that, that produced uh, out, of, out, of, uh, uh, out of collider instruments. And so we will be working with teams uh, who work with CERN, who work with uh, high energy physics uh, applications in the United States, developing the next generation uh, HEP infrastructure, which will help move uh, the data from new instruments and help process it faster. And this will take advantage both of uh, the transoceanic links that FAB will, will take advantage of, as well as fabric uh, continental United States footprint and chameleon cloud, where a large number of resources can be brought to bear to uh, serve some of these applications and in a number of locations. So this is, uh, this is kind of a brief example of what can be done. And this was my last slide. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Fabric, visit uh, uh, whatisfabric.net. That's the main website for the facility. 
Um, if you'd like to stay continuously informed about what's going on, there's a button there that says get involved. If you press that and fill out a small form, uh, you will get about a monthly or every couple of months mailing about our progress and you'll be able to learn about workshops and other uh, uh, outreach opportunities that we are putting together. Um, all our code is in GitHub and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for this opportunity. Hi, Ilya. Uh, thanks for accepting our invitation. It is a pleasure to have you here with us today. Hello, Marcos. Thank you for having me. Uh, we requested the audience for uh, the questions through the chat, and I'll be reading them as they are coming. And to start, I have a question. So what are different challenges in operating a testbed after it's built uh, than the ones that you uh, uh, mentioned regarding the construction phase? Sure. Um, so I, yeah, I've played a, um, a number of roles within the Genie project, which is a, as I said, a, in many ways, a precursor to Fabric, at least intellectually speaking. Um, so I would say uh, the main challenges in um, operating at such a test bed is uh, moderating user expectations and user education. Um, uh, if experimenters come with various preconceived notions about what a testbed can and cannot do, and sometimes they expect too much and sometimes they expect too little. And so um, uh, basically continuous kind of outreach uh, to various user communities, explaining to them, you know, your capabilities, your new capabilities if you're developing them, um, is absolutely critical for that um, aspect that I mentioned, you know, sort of... Uh, keeping your, your uh, user communities kind of satisfied and engaged with your facility. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, we have a question here from Leandro Siufu. So you're speaking in an event for computer network engineers. Why computer network guys should care about e science applications? Excellent question. Um, I would say that the main reason why um, computer network researchers um, should care about um, science up e-science applications is because those applications actually provide the some of the most interesting um, uh, ways for applying novel ideas from computer science computer networking to very practical very pressing problems so if if if, if you're looking for a problem to solve just talk to a few um, e-science uh, uh, um, uh, um, researchers who are moving data or processing data and, and you will you will hear about an, a large number of problems that need to be solved there are solutions of course uh, but they're always looking for something better faster you know to to them to the scientists it's all about productivity it's all about time to discovery they're not necessarily interested in the specific ways that the bits move but they are interested in in, the, in moving the bits and processing the bits and so it's it's our job as computer science researchers, computer networking researchers, that to to make their discovery um, uh, kind of um, less prone to friction, more friction free. Great. Uh, another question also: Are there currently international collaborations with South America and the Brazilian communities in Fabric project? Within Fabric specifically, uh, no, but kind of through an a, a, in a, through association, yes, we are. Um, we we will have a node at Florida International University, and I'm sure uh, many of you know Julio. Uh, and so through him, we are um, you know we are looking for ways to extend Fabric uh, to South America. Uh, Julio Barra, sorry, I should have said his last name, <laughs> but I think everybody knows him. Um, so um, our, our, our strategy right now is to work through Julio and to see how we can connect various instruments, uh, various networks in South America to Fabric and, and kind of grow our, um, our community that way. Great, and just to clarify that from our RNP side, we have uh, some project proposals that are currently in evaluation to fund either researches or uh, infrastructure to join in Fabric and uh, participate in the collaboration. Uh, 
So I have another question. Uh, you mentioned very interesting trade-offs in building test beds. Uh, can you talk a little bit more, maybe share some experiences or example, either from Fabric or previous projects regarding those trade-offs to uh, have a success, uh, successful uh, test bed? Right. Well, so there's, there's, there's. I mean, I can, I can give you many bad examples of how not enough to make those trade-offs. Uh, basically, um, I would say uh, um, doing anything and assuming that you know, if you build it, that they will come, is probably one of the worst sins that you can commit in building a test bed. Um, you know, before, um, you know, before designing your abstractions. You know, it, a test would ultimately offer some set of abstractions and operations on them, right? So most trade-offs come into play in how those abstractions are exposed, what levels of programmability they offer, and so on. So um, offer it at too low a level, and many people will get turned off because it's just too complicated. Nobody wants to write assembly language, right? Offer it too high a level, and you cover up some levels of flexibility that certain communities were looking for. So I would say that that's... That's one of the best examples. And, and, and then developing ahead of time and saying, well, here, look at it. You've got it. You know, you have to be very careful because it's time. It's investment of time and engineering effort. And, you know, it may fall flat because your experimenters may not actually have been looking for it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Leandro Mondin. He congratulates on the ambitious fabric project. And you comment that Fabric is a scientific instrument. So he's not sure if this is a world phenomenon, but we observe it in Brazil. Uh, there are uh, the area of interest of the scientific community sometimes changes rapidly. How changing is it to build a testbed that requires a long time to build, but that still uh, meets the needs of the scientific community? It's extremely challenging. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, to be sure, you know, we started thinking about fabric and, and kind of working with the community on ideas of what fabric might look like probably three years before we got funded. So it was a very long process. And, and, and the process continues. It's what I, I think I mentioned that, you know, the process of engagement with your community has to be continuous. Um, one of the things we're doing is, you know, we're working with some early experimenters and saying, look, uh, you know, we're going to have enough things running by, as I mentioned, you know, summer 2021, that you can actually come and, and kick the tires. And, you know, you have to be patient with us. Things aren't going to be perfect. But at the very least, you know, you can start doing some of the work that you couldn't do anywhere else. It's absolutely unfair to ask the community to sit and twiddle their th thumbs, as it were, wait for four years until you get things done. You, you know, you need to have kind of a graduated way of offering your capabilities early, perhaps to a select few or you know small number of, of experimenters and then expanding that circle over time. Thank you, Ilya. So another uh, question, uh, could Fabric provide means to reproducible research practice in networking and computing uh, disciplines? We're certainly looking to learn from some of the better test bits that are doing this out there. You would think, you know, for instance, Cloud Lab offers this concept of um, experiment profiles, right, which are kind of reproducible experiment elements of experiments that could be stood up, and that's that's a very good thing. Um, Chameleon Cloud in the United States, uh, out of the University of Chicago, um, has been doing a lot of work with reproducibility. They have a very a uh, capable set of kind of um, features related to using Jupyter uh, Notebooks and Jupyter Hub, which again, you know, it's it's mechanical, but it makes your experiments much more reproducible because you're now, you know, you have mechanisms by which you record kind of your experiment runs. And of course, measurements is another uh, important aspect, right? So we are spending I mean, easily we're spending about half of our engineering time on the software side in developing the measurement system, and the other half goes towards portal and control framework. Great. Uh, we have a question from Michelle uh, Wangen. Uh, in the future, Brazilian researchers could use Fabric. What is the path uh, for this to be real? I think you know these these. I don't I don't have a well um, established answer to this. I think the in general rule from NSF in the past has been National Science Foundation to open these facilities to international researchers with, you know, a little bit of validation. 
Um, I, you know, it's certainly a case in, in Genie. I would expect that to be true for fabric, but we so far have not discussed this with the National Science Foundation in depth. That's okay. Uh, we have also a question from Leobino Sampaio. Uh, you have mentioned about the possibility of uh, making available NDN for orders. Could you provide more details about it? Does Fabric make available NDN stack on networking nodes? Um, Fabric doesn't provide anything yet because it's under construction, but the intent is, uh, yes, to provide um, easy to stand up elements of NDN, including NDN forwarders that could be instantiated on Fabric as, you know, elements of a slice. And, uh, and we're working quite closely with the NDN community. We're engaged with the uh, uh, group at, at, at uh, National Institute of Standards uh, and Technologies uh, in the U.S. that have that were the ones who developed the NDN forwarder code base. We're working with a couple of groups who are um, kind of also involved with N using NDN for a variety of e-science applications. So yes, the intent is to actually have them among the early experimenters and to work with them to make sure that NDN um, elements of NDN stack can be easily stood up on Fabric. So we have one last question. Uh, due to the nature of its experiments, how is Fabric planning to overcome the challenges to bring high speed, for instance, 100 gig and above to the test but particip participant endpoints, like a lab inside a university campus? So that's always been a, a, a excellent, this is an excellent question. It's always been a challenge. Um, in the US, the, um, uh, you, you're starting to see 100 gig technologies pop up much more you know, you see wider prevalence of them in the variety of settings, including on campuses. So um, we always tell the host campuses which uh, have or which we will have um, uh, fabric nodes that they should consider that node not the endpoint of communications, but rather a router that allows essentially on, on their premises to connect to other resources beyond that. And we're encouraging them to connect to, you know, with, with as high po as speed as possible um, to those to those nodes. So I would say that this is an evolving story. Um, our intent is to connect as many of our nodes with 100 gig capacity to the core, which will be 100 gig, uh, as we can, whether using dedicated optical capacity or shared layer two capacity, you know, that remains to be seen. It's a, it's a conversation that's had basically with each, with each site individually. That's part of what takes deploying fabric, you know, such a labor intensive process is every site is a snowflake, essentially, they're all different. And then what goes on beyond that, um, you know, NSF has some funding opportunities for extending campus infrastructure, uh, you know, upgrading it. Uh, and so, you know, we would be looking to the community to actually work on that. Um, you know, our goal is to construct the core of, the, of this facility, and then, uh, you know, work work with the with the community to extend it beyond that but not necessarily with our money or even our hands uh, we uh, don't think that fabric is um i don't we don't think it's feasible for us to just claim we can build fabric you know top to bottom and everything we are very actively looking for community input and community contrib contributions uh, I've been said that we have a question for uh, time for one last question i have one of my own so it's uh, a little bit technical but uh, I know that you have been uh, deciding for the, uh, I would say, orchestration-based uh, software, mm -hmm. and something between OpenStack and Kubernetes is that defined already, and is, there's just a little bit of uh, information regarding what is the decision points bet between them. So after talking to our community, you know, we, we do have interest in containers, but there is a large interest in sort of isolation, and so virtual machines seem to be the, the thing that we want to support first, right? Um, that seems to dictate, and that's what we're doing now, is using OpenStack as a foundational element of the provisioning infrastructure. And on top of that, we have a layer of our orchestration that helps essentially orchestrate the data plane and the compute part together um, in the various ways I showed you a long list of network services that we're going to offer. That's kind of part of the reason why we're constructing our own orchestration uh, layer on top. But OpenStack for now, I think that we will offer ability to do containers inside virtual machines, you know, an easy way to deploy, you know, doc individual dockers or perhaps Docker Compose or, or Swarm. Uh, um, you know, with respect to Kubernetes, I think the question is still open. The problem 
I see with Kubernetes is it's it's really targeted at kind of utility computing, and we want isolation, and that's where there's a there's a big um, separation, I guess, for us. We're not trying to serve as many users as possible with the substrate. We're trying to serve as many users as we can without too much interference from each other. And that's a very different optimization point compared to what, for instance, something like Kubernetes is designed for. That's great. So we're reaching the end of our session. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya, for the great presentation and for uh, answering all the questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so now I'll hand back to Francisco, and I uh, will probably be in touch regarding evol evolutions of our initiatives and also with Fabric. Absolutely. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Francisco, você tá mudo. Sorry, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Marcos. Obrigado, Marcos. Thank you, Mr. Baldi, for your presentation. Uh, muito obrigado pelas essas, discuss essas discussões. A apresentação foi sensacional. Tivemos muitas e muitas pessoas participando junto conosco aqui nos, no, no chat, tá? Então foi muito legal. É, agora eu preciso que vocês nos ajudem aí no hashtag arroba, é, WRNP2020, tá? Porque ainda está muito abaixo do que a gente está tá buscando. Olha só, eu queria agradecer o... A gente está aqui acompanhando, né, em real time, aqui as, as, os twitters. Temos aqui o, o professor Abelém, que vai estar conosco aí provavelmente amanhã, tá? Ele tweetou lá. Temos aqui, provavelmente, se eu não me engano, deve ser aqui dos nossos países vizinhos. A Tânia, também como... É, Twitter, uh, agora, agora tivemos um outro Twitter do Leandro Montinho, agradecemos vocês por estar tweetando, estar conosco nas redes sociais. Então, você ainda que não tweetou, hashtag WRNP2020, tá? Isso é importante porque a gente gera conhecimento. Se você, o evento é gratuito, a partir do momento que você começa a divulgar isso, outras pessoas na nossa rede, né, na nossa rede social, na nossa rede, no nosso network, pode ter interesse nesse evento e vir, né? agregar conhecimento né, na, na sua vida e então é importante você compartilhar. Outra aderência que ainda está baixa aqui, ó. Vamos lá, hein? Tivemos ainda só abaixo de 40 pessoas. Então vamos aproveitar agora essa essa sessão aí. Responde lá a primeira enquete nossa que é importante para a gente, tá? Então nessa nessa próxima enquete a gente vai ter aí é, um time sensacional, né? Um time aí da RNP que só só estrelas, tá? Então a gente vai, eu vou chamar agora o nosso diretor de de finanças, né, e administração, opa, administração e finanças, eu tô confuso que teve uma mudança aqui na RNP agora, mas é assim mesmo, vamos lá, convidamos agora o nosso diretor de administração e finanças, né, o Zé Luiz, para moderar uma nova sessão, a sessão é o quê? Desafios da RNP na oferta de serviços de cibersegurança durante a pandemia, então, sem dúvida, vai ser uma sessão sensacional, please, Zé Luiz,